Oh, somewhere between aftershave, balm, <laughs> axle grease, transmission fluid, <laughs> road tar. Yeah, it's quite the bouquet. <laughs> the amount of oil that we believe is trapped in the uh, oil shales of our three states is four times the amount of oil uh, currently estimated to be beneath the sands of Saudi Arabia. I have, to, I have to heat it pretty good for it. So that's a piece of oil shale? That's yes, a piece of oil shale. Like, you just find that line on the ground? Or is that... Yes, it was yeah, out on an outcrop. Oh. Cool, huh? That's pretty neat. Colorado's Peons Basin contains an organic matter called kerogen. Kerogen is a precursor to oil that is abundant in northwest Colorado's oil shale rich Peons Basin. Oil shale was formed by decaying organic matter, like plants, trees, and animals in a prehistoric lake bed millions of years ago. The U.S. Department of Energy estimates that the U.S. supply of recoverable oil from oil shale is equal to all of the world's proven crude supply. The Energy Information Service has uh, indicated that there is somewhere between 500 billion and 1.1 trillion barrels of oil that could be recovered from oil shale deposits in Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. For a nation, that is very weary of the high prices that we are paying at the pump and who is very weary about our over-dependence on the sheiks and kings of the Middle East and other places where uh, large global reserves of oil currently are held. It is important that we take a look at, these, at this uh, strategic opportunity for the United States of America. Back in the teens, 19 teens and 20s, there was a rush here after the First World War, as I said, because oil prices had uh, gone up to three dollars and fifty cents a barrel and there was a big land boom too of course people were buying up land there were a lot of promoters selling land out here all these people would come too and someone would buy land and and uh, buy goods and services in the area uh, there was also an oil shale demonstration facility in Chicago there was one in Denver where people were brought in to basically sell them stock in companies that for the most part were pretty bogus. 1930s come along, it's cheaper oil is found elsewhere including Southern California. We're starting to use cars. There's a baby boom, we're going to need more oil. People start looking again at oil shale, including Cornell University in 1957 does this incredible plan for a shale city. And this giant metropolis that we're going to have monorails connecting this city and the oil shale mines. And then when Exxon comes in a little later, their project, and as a Western historian, I love this name, they called it the Colony Oil Shale Project because indeed they wanted to take the Western Slope and make it into a colony of Houston and Exxon. Things sleep then through the 60s. By the 1973 OPEC oil crunch, all of a sudden uh, Americans who never like to wait are having to wait in line to get their gasoline. There's a real crunch now to find alternative fuels and oil shale uh, goes to the front. The little companies had been involved for a while. Suddenly the largest corporation in the world, Exxon USA, comes in and says, boys, we're going to show you how to do this. An energy message from Amoco. This gasoline wasn't made from crude oil. It was made from rock, like this, oil shale. Underneath this Amoco project in Colorado lie vast amounts of shale from which oil can be extracted. It will be years before this shale can be converted into fuels on a large scale. But this is just one of the ways Amoco is working to provide secure new supplies of energy in America. America runs better on American oil. Oil shale was the largest boom in an industrializing industry in the United States in the early 1980s. Nobody knows exactly how much money they'd, they'd spent. Fortune magazine estimates $970 million in 18 months. The image I think of is driving a dump truck full of $100 bills 
down through the little towns in the Colorado River Valley and simply opening the back gate and letting all these hundred dollar bills float through the streets. The city of Rifle was popping as was the surrounding countryside. A lot of things were happening, a lot of people were in the area. There were a lot of people who came to the area looking for work, not recognizing that there wasn't housing available. There were times when we had people who were living under bridges, uh, in, in culverts, um, tents, and once again it was uh, kind of a, a what, what normally would be considered a boom town. A boom town is a place, and in my context it's a rural community, that experiences rapid growth from outsiders who come in uh, because they're jobs, because they're opportunities. It was like the wild frontier when Oil Shell came here because all of a sudden we had thousands of guys, mostly single men. We had bars springing up everywhere and stores and businesses were going great guns. We were doing this for energy independence. We were doing this for the good of America and anybody who wasn't interested had better get off the boat because it was leaving the dock. You know, I had a lot of fun. I was single at the time and I would, you know, dress up and nice clothes and walk into bars and have all these guys falling all over. There were people walking down our main streets here in Rifle with, you know, hundreds of dollars dripping out of their pockets. Uh, we finally had whores in parachute. They'd come over from Denver. They were operating out of a VW bus. That had never happened before. You know, there's some new variety in town. And then on May 1st, 1982, it's announced that the corporate board of Exxon has decided to stop. Uh, they, they basically announced on Sunday, May 2nd, that we are closing our oil shale plant and the workers were locked out. Oil shell workers were not even permitted to get their jean jackets out of their lockers. They were so afraid of espionage, of, of sabotage. There was about 2,000 workers, but you have to realize that those 2,000 workers are supported by 500 contractors, subcontractors, and those subcontractors have wives that work at the local stores. 2,300 people lost their jobs overnight. 6,000 people left the valley by the end of the summer. And there were amazing stories about oil shell workers driving down the Grand Junction, stealing semi-trucks full of alcohol, bringing it back, wild parties. It wasn't like that. It was sadness. It was deep sadness. It was a whole lot of drinking. So from 1982 to about 1995, uh, we had our depression around here. At a bank that went under, in that time period here in Rifle and uh, uh, it's one of those situations that I thought was out of the 1930s. Businesses that had survived the Great Depression in Grand Junction, Colorado that did not survive the oil shale bust. Because so many foreclosures happened up in this area, you couldn't get a bank loan. I bought my home in 1980 for 75,000. By 1981, it was worth 90,000. 1983, it was worth 35,000. Um, I was without work for quite a while. I, I put up my piano for sale. There were people that just walked away from their homes. The thing was, I didn't have any place to walk to, so that's why I stuck it out. I had roommates. Um, you know, you did what you could to survive. Um, I ended up with three part-time jobs, one including working as a cleaning lady up in Aspen. And, you know, a good use of my college degree. Exxon, I found out, had a secret clause in every single contract they had with their subcontractors. And there were probably 30 to 50 subcontractors. And in each of those contracts was the language that said Exxon could close down any project within 30 days and only be liable for the cost of materials and wages for 30 days from the point of a shutdown. No one had said any of that up front to any of the county commissioners. So here the county commissioners are building new hospitals, 
They're building new schools, libraries, they're expanding infrastructure. They assume that when the largest corporation in the world says it's going to do something, that it means it. We're, we're here in the location of the most concentrated onshore hydrocarbon on Earth. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez! This is just an immature oil. It won't flow. It's not greasy. You know, it, nothing occurs to it. Um, you know, two things can happen. We can wait 100 million years and this will become a world-class oil field. Or, in the next two or three years, we can do what Mother Nature would take 100 million years to do. And we can, by applying heat, we can cause these molecules to break down and release oil and gas. Shell's patented oil shale recovery process, known as the in situ conversion process, or ICP, works by drilling holes to reach the targeted oil shale layers, known as the mahogany zone, 2,000 feet beneath the surface. Electric heaters are then inserted into the holes and gradually heat the shale over a period of a few years. This gradual heating over time causes the oil and gas to be released from the shale rock, where it then moves through the rock's cracks and crevasses. First of all, I think you all know that I'm chairman of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee of the United States Senate. successfully developing this vast oil shale resource will mean so much more for America than just finding one more source for energy. It could literally shake the world. Oil shale is the most misunderstood fossil fuel in the world, I argue. Um, we have been trying to unlock oil shale in Colorado for more than a century. The federal government is encouraging oil and gas companies to do oil shale research and I support that. I want to find out once and for all whether oil shale is something real or whether oil shale is a mirage. History would suggest it's a mirage. There are others who would argue that oil shale is a bad bet, pointing to the past boom and bust. I believe it is eminently clear that things are different now. We are more dependent on foreign oil than ever before. Our world is more fragile and unstable place than it was before, and energy prices have soared compared to where they were the last two times we ventured into shale oil. If this is such an incredible resource, uh, the proponents of oil shale are often talking about a trillion barrels of oil shale here in Colorado. Uh, we've got 1.6 trillion, we've got 800 billion, we've got 2 trillion barrels of oil shale reserves. People have been saying this for 100 years. So if we have that much oil, if we have that much oil shale, why aren't we using it? This is a great mystery. I think it would be wrong for us as a nation to just say no to oil shale, to look at uh, what has happened historically and say we've tried it before uh, and uh, we are not to look at it again. As it relates to oil shale and tar sands, the energy bill directs the Secretary of Interior to make certain lands available for leasing. In theory, there are two ways of producing oil shale. You can strip off the cover then you can drill, blast, load, haul oil shale rocks to a processing plant. This is what we tried in the 1970s. At the processing plant you can heat it up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit and then you take the slag, the leftovers, and you haul that back and dump it somewhere. The other way of doing it, which would have reduced environmental impacts, is to try to produce the oil shale without moving the rocks. And that's what shale oil company and other companies are trying to do.
While Shell's current testing has demonstrated promising results, Shell is deliberately taking a cautious and thoughtful approach to its research in order to avoid the mistakes of past oil shale efforts. Protecting the groundwater is a key objective of Shell's research. Shell's first test in the next research phase will be a freeze wall test, which is designed to create an ice barrier, causing underground water to flow around the targeted oil shale production zone, not through it. The next phase of research, freeze wall test, will start by drilling holes around the perimeter of a test area about the size of a football field. Equipment will be installed to circulate a chilled liquid into the holes. The chilled liquid will lower temperatures close to the holes to the point that the water in the ground will turn to ice. The volume of ice will grow as the ground continues to get colder, and after many months, the ice will connect from one hole to the next to effectively create a wall of ice that acts like a barrier around the perimeter of the test area. Future research may involve heating and freezing. With the wall of ice formed, the test area inside the wall will have any remaining water pumped out to confirm that the area is isolated from water outside. A buffer zone between the freeze wall and the heating will prevent interaction or melting between the two processes. Once the heating tests are completed, the area inside the freeze wall will be reclaimed and the freezing will be brought to an end, allowing natural subsurface temperatures to slowly melt the wall of ice away. You hear what they're doing it is a strange combination of Buck Rogers and Tom Swift. They want to drill wells 30 feet apart, 2,000 feet deep, and then insert electrical heaters in each one of these wells. Once that's done, they want to heat the rock to 800 degrees Fahrenheit for four years. And after all of that time, they will begin producing oil. When you begin running the numbers about the amount of energy you would have to create in the form of electricity to heat the rocks to 800 degrees Fahrenheit for four years, it's staggering. They would need to build Colorado's largest power plant in the state's history to produce 100,000 barrels a day with this method. They would need to build a $3 billion power plant and consume its entire output to produce 100,000 barrels a day of oil shale. The greenhouse gas emissions would be staggering. Their utility bill would be staggering. I mean, it would be the world's largest single electricity consumer. So keep in mind, our process has been field research. This is not our first shot. We've been doing this for 25 years. It turns out that oil shale is the world's uh, worst fossil fuel. And what do I mean by worst? It has the poorest energy content, the least energy per ton of any of the fossil fuels. It will be doing a lot of research on the products that come out of the ground, but our field research, even on a small scale without all the fancy service equipment, has demonstrated that we do make transportation fuels. I can tell you from the test that you saw, the small shallow test that we did, we made 1,700 barrels of oil plus associated gas. The best People talk about rich oil shale. The best oil shale is worse than the worst coal. Okay? This is just barely a fossil fuel. Some people have described it as unborn petroleum. When I ran the numbers, it turns out that there's much less energy in oil shale than there is in recycled phone books or peat moss or dried animal manure. Um, there's much less energy in oil shale than there is in cornflakes or Captain Crunch. There's about as much energy in oil shale per ton as you would have in baked potatoes. So if I told you there were a trillion tons of baked potatoes buried in Colorado a thousand feet deep, would you be in any hurry to go get them? No. Would it be possible to make an economic industry out of it? Unlikely. And that is the real explanation. Um, that we have not had a successful oil shale industry in the United States. It's not that technology has been lacking. It's not that there haven't been adequate federal subsidies. We spent $5 billion of federal money on this in the 1970s. It's that fundamentally these things are the dregs. 
let me, let me give you a parallel statement. Do you know the great sand dunes national uh, park in, in southern Colorado in the San Luis Valley? Uh, somebody told me, I don't remember the figure, but you know, there's X billions of dollars of gold in that sand. But he went on to say it's safe. And that's because it's so It takes so much energy and cost to extract it that nobody's going to do it. And I think that this has been the downfall of all the efforts thus far in oil shale. The energy and effort necessary to extract the oil from the shale has been a killing thing. In 25 years, we've had a lot of learnings, successes and failures, and we're ready to ask the public to trust us with their land to do it right. They may prove me wrong. I wish them well. I hope they continue their research. We need to put to rest once and for all this idea that oil shale is this incredible resource. If it is, let's unlock it. Let's pull the sword from the stone. If it isn't, let's quit pretending it is. most parts of the United States, gas production, natural gas production, is going down. The Rocky Mountains are one of the few regions where natural gas production is going up. And that's why we see so much drilling in our backyards. From my home there in Garfield County, south, about five miles south of Silk, I can see um, probably between 10 and 15 producing wells. I can see 10 rigs that are working. I can smell emissions fairly constantly. We have a total of uh, 24 wells, um, 360 degrees around our 40 acre parcel. Right now there are something like 3,500 wells in Garfield County and anecdotally we have heard that this is about 10% of the ultimate total. I came here to tell you a little story. Yesterday I drove from Rifle to Grand Junction to see my son in a play at Mesa State College. I've driven that stretch of highway for 33 years. I moved here in 1973. And when I did, the air in western Colorado was so clear that you could see 90 miles. This is not the case now. Our future does not look very bright, and I no longer want to live in western Colorado. My home of 33 years is being systematically destroyed by an industry that could not care less. A gentleman from the industry made a comment to one of the board members of the GVCA and he said that Garfield County is now a gas county. You can either accept it or get out. In Colorado and in many other states, um, there's a phenomenon called the split estate. And most of the issues here in western Colorado come from folks who own the surface rights but who do not own the mineral rights below the surface that they own. 
controversy comes when uh, I, as a landowner, uh, want to have peaceful enjoyment of my property and uh, XYZ oil and gas company wants to get the gas from under my property. Now we'll go into a bit of history on the origins of the split estate. This nation and its founding was going to be about farming and that whole agrarian dream. But the question of what to do with minerals was really not anything anybody had spent a lot of time thinking about. The uh, 1916 Stock Raising Homestead Act is a, a moment where that that whole project of having a nation oriented towards farmers just comes whacking up against the question of what happens with minerals beneath the surface. It might well have seen. I can. I don't think we have to strain our imaginations to see why people would have said, well, let's separate those. By this point, 1916, we certainly have seen a lot of mining, coal mining, as well as precious metal mining, and it's a very different sort of transaction. So what does this mean in practice? Well, it's a really interesting legal idea, a really interesting configuration of that always complicated thing. What do we mean by ownership? What do we mean by property? How do you apply it to different substances and different commodities and so on? It's always very interesting, but it gets really interesting and really concrete and really consequential when it turns out that in some cases uh, the drilling occurs pretty close to people's homes. It occurs in areas and locations that seem directly tied to water supply. I knock wood, I pray every day when I go to my mailbox because I don't own my mineral rights. One of the main features of trying to live intelligently in the West today is reckoning with this heritage we have of laws that were passed at a distance in time and at a distance in space. When I bought my property five years ago, well, the, there was only one well every 640 acres. That's what they were allowed. You know, one well every 640 acres, you're not too, you know, you're not too worried about it. Now it's like one, some places it's one well every 40 acres, some places it's one well every 20 acres, some places one well every 10 acres. I don't think there is a square inch of the American West that does not have an advocate, an enthusiast, a lover. And I, I don't fault natural gas producers for being caught by surprise by that because a lot of these areas are places that 50 years ago, 100 years ago, would not have had any champions, would not have had anyone even noticing that uh, that any transformation had occurred there. So there are operators, uh, natural gas producers, who will go to a lot of trouble to make sure that they are accommodating the surface owner's concerns, that they are using, uh, that, for instance, that practice called directional drilling, where you have one central location where the, uh, the noise and the emissions and the actions concentrate. But as with professors and doctors and dentists and so on, there's variation, and some of the operators are nowhere near as, as scrupulous and careful. There's a, a tremendous range in what people will offer, for instance, in the way of, of remediation and revegetation and efforts to put a landscape back together. Last week we actually um, smelled fumes coming from the new one. Since 2000, um, September 2004, when Incana came to this neighborhood, they drilled um, nine wells um, starting in September of 2004. On uh, January 25th, uh, we got some really bad fumes off this well, and it was at 9 o'clock at night. Um, apparently there was a spill, and um, the valve to the actual gas well had stuck open. That plain smokestack there is, um, is a stack coming off the tank um, with these, um, these chemicals in them. In, in them. It's uh, uh, toluene, benzene, and xylene. And that's just steaming out of there all the time. Since then, um, I just have a lot of nausea all the time, um, a lot of wooziness. We're trying to sell our property, although with the knowledge of what's going on here, we could become liable for a person who lived here and then became sick. So we could actually become liable for what they're doing. It has been the contention of the industry for a long time
that because they drill at one depth and surface waters are at another depth, that they cannot, uh, they cannot pollute groundwater. Well, that's absolutely untrue. Uh, and the best case in point, of course, is the Divide Creek Seep. What really happened? How that uh, gas came you know, to the surface here, the Schwarzwell over there, they did a lousy cementing job. So the gas escaped, and there are some geological sensitive fractures right underneath here. So that's where the gas came to the surface, and hence the, the bubbling you know, that occurred here. One of the residents up there had been walking down by the creek and had encountered this huge expanse of the creek that was bubbling furiously with gas coming out of the soil and underneath the creek. It's been two years. Uh, it, it's not really cleaned up to, to a point that you're happy with? Well, obviously I'm not happy. No, nobody could be happy if toxic gases you know, spew out on your, on, on your property. Right. My concern is here we have one situation. If it happens again and again, or if it happens somewhere else where nobody sees it, there's a lot of water here. Right. It's not monitored. It could be. It could be. You know, coming out somewhere else too. So the Environmental Protection Agency is not out here, and who who from Colorado state government's out here? Nobody. Nobody. And to this day, the Divide Creek seep continues to bubble, and it's been over two years. I calculated that it will probably continue to bubble for at least eight and a half years, judging from the numbers that the industry says they lost. They lost 115 million cubic feet of gas in the. That's their estimate. And at 46,000 cubic feet a day, which is the estimate of how much is coming out of Divide Creek, that works out to about eight and a half years. That's if those numbers are accurate. But the point is, the point is this. In Canada, <clears throat> under state law, has no responsibility to compensate the owners of that land for the loss in value of that land. Now that that owner can take in Canada to court, but uh, how confident do you feel uh, if you were to have to file a suit against the largest and most powerful and wealthy industry in the world? It's been one long day since I left my home on Divide Creek where I belong, where the mule deer run and sage is number one, and nap wheat grows more than corn. And Canada sells heating gas to the town I thought that it would be true They drilled my ranch, they sucked my gas They bulldozed my homestead too What have they done to the old home place? How did they blow it down? And how did they poison my water and hay? By drilling for gas in the ground What have they done to the old home place? How do they blow it down? And how do they poison my water and hay by drilling for gas in the ground? What have they done to the old home place? How do they boil it down? And how do they put benzene in Divide Creek by drilling for gas in the ground? By drilling for gas in the ground? By drilling for gas in the ground? Some six miles from this tiny western Colorado town, a unique experiment will be conducted by a joint industry and government team. A nuclear explosive equal to 40,000 tons of TNT will be used to shake loose a great natural gas reserve locked tightly in a formation called the Mesa Verde. The experiment is called Project Rulison, part of the Atomic Energy Commission's Plowshare Program, 
to develop peaceful applications for nuclear explosives. Despite numerous protests, the Atomic Energy Commission set off an underground atomic blast in western Colorado yesterday to check into how well underground natural gas deposits might be released by atomic energy. The 40 kiloton device, the AEC classifies it in the low intermediate range, was put in a hole more than 8,000 feet deep. The purpose of Project Rulison, to unlock the vast quantities of natural gas which are now not commercially obtainable in the tightly compacted sandstone rock here on Colorado's western slope. This afternoon, health officials went from farm to farm, ordering evacuation within a six-mile radius, just in case. Four hours before the blast, public health officials went to homes in a nine-mile radius, warning residents to leave for the day. A few people decided to stay. The members of the local sheriff's posse were out early, manning roadblocks to keep people away from the place where the bomb was going to go off. In Grand Valley, seven miles away, there was a feeling of excitement but no one seemed to be too concerned about possible danger. Officials and civic leaders were to watch the blast from an observation tent six miles away. Not everyone was happy about Project Rillison. About a hundred protesters marched on the observation tent. Among them were people who had long opposed the blast because of the danger of contamination should any radioactive gas escape. Their court protests had failed, but they were still trying to get the blast postponed. They talked with a representative of the Atomic Energy Commission, but to no avail. Everyone got ready, and the countdown began. Shook like jelly, there was a muffled sound, and rocks and dirt broke loose from surrounding mesas. Within minutes, workers were at the site of the blast checking for radioactivity. They found none. Officials said it had been a success. They gathered around trailers at their control point and drank champagne to celebrate. In the spring of 1969, the Atomic Energy Commission, which then controlled and operated the U.S. nuclear weapons program, announced that it had a new program called Plowshare, taken from the famous phrase in the Bible, they shall beat their swords into plowshares. This was a program, it seemed to many, to sort of legitimize the nuclear weapons program. So the notion that was presented for western Colorado, and indeed a vast area of the American Southwest where these deep, tight, gas deposits exist was to use a very powerful explosive device, a, a nuclear bomb, to uh, blast a cavity deep in these formations uh, with a lot of fractures extending out to let the gas seep over then into this cavity that the explosion had created. I have never said on this shot or any other of the maybe 150 that I've had that it would not matter. Because I don't know. I have said this to every group that we've talked to. And if it does it, even though we don't know how, we will be prepared to see that nobody gets hurt. Now, what now, now, all right. They held a set of public hearings uh, around Colorado, and many of them in Denver. And we began to attend those uh, to learn more and see what they were saying, and, and they were covered by the media. You spend $82 million a day on a war effort, you can certainly spend a few, uh, a few thousand dollars to postpone a test for as long as it takes. Six months, what do you care? We're not going to run out of gas in that length of time. We hold down the noise so everyone can hear. They were establishing a five-mile quarantine zone around the blast site. And so to our minds, that sounded like a deal we couldn't refuse uh, and that we would put them, test their words and, and such by being present in the quarantine zone as an act of civil disobedience. We were dropped off by the cars who ferried us up on the mountainside on rural Garfield County uh, gravel roads uh, in the dark. AEC security officers scanned the mountains for others too close to the detonation site, mainly small bands of young protesters from Denver and Boulder. Uh, we spread out over the mountain uh, and uh, 
in our groups of two and one group of three uh, with no way really to stay connected. Uh, uh, we also had a group of friends who were down mixing it up with the official media and the officials at the official viewing site and uh, they were telling people what we were doing and why we were up there uh, and in fact some of our people had even held a press conference so it was not secret uh, that we were up there and of course we never intended that it would be because it was an open act of civil disobedience to challenge their statement that they would not set the bomb off if anyone was within the five-mile quarantine zone. Helicopter patrols kept them some distance from the site, but still a few vowed to stay within two miles. We talked with one group just before they went into hiding in the hills. This, in a way, this is kind of a desperation move, but in a way it isn't. It's, it's kind of a first step as far as I'm concerned. It's really encouraging to see the people in this area taking some action. We tried to arrange ourselves and of course we were listening to the portable radio, listening to the countdown uh, as uh, it was being broadcast all over western Colorado. Five, four, three, two, one, fire! So after the blast went off uh, and the aftershocks, why well, we stood up and looked around and one of the things we saw was that the the uh, huge cliffs on the north side of the Colorado River Valley there were shedding probably tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of tons of rock that hadn't moved in geologic ages. That was the big boom and, and then we sort of gathered ourselves mentally and emotionally and physically and, and began to wind ourselves down the mountain. Uh, we had arranged for friends of ours who had dropped us off uh, on the mountain sides, rural roads to again be patrolling those roads and looking for us so that we could be picked up and taken away uh, uh, and uh, rest our, our exhausted selves uh, and such. Uh. This, this is the site, ground zero, right where we're standing. And this is the spot where they lowered the uh, 43 kiloton nuclear device into the ground and, and set it off in 1969. Behind me is, is our home where we live. And where we're standing is uh, above a creek that runs under the road. It's known as Hayward Creek. We're about 130 feet from ground zero and we're about uh, 300 feet from my house. So the ground zero actually sits practically in our front yard. Uh, that blast happened in 1969 and in 1976 I had a chance to buy this 40 acres. Well, I made my first trip to Colorado in 1962 with a group of guys from Tennessee, and we'd come out every fall hunting. And uh, I just fell in love with, with the mountains and all this area. And when I finally got a chance to find a little piece of property way up in the mountains out of the way, you know, I was 34 years old then. And, but I was concerned about the radiation. And after DOE assured me that this site was safe, then I purchased the 40 acres from Mr. Lee Hayward. And uh, I, my wife and I built a uh, retirement home here now, and we spend about six months out of a year out here. And I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't afraid of uh, what was here because I'd been assured. I mean, I felt safe all these years. I don't glow in the dark, my kids don't. There is a well within one half a mile of the site of the ground zero. And back in the early spring of this year, Presco was a gas company that had apply, applied for a permit to, to drill within 900 feet of ground zero. You know, and I'm not against gas exploration, oil exploration. You know, this company needs to find what, whatever sources of energy we can find to continue on in the, into the future. Uh, but why come right here on top of a known nuclear blast site 
and fool around with it and stir it up and drag it out and pollute the air and the water. I was looking for some property. Part of the, the Weldon property came up for sale and, and I, I bought 14 acres from him adjacent to the Lewison Blast site. Well, I, I felt comfortable buying it after, uh, you know, knowing the history, uh, researching some of it myself. One of the reasons I bought the property was because of the three-mile exclusion around it. This would be the last place they'd ever drill. They'd never drill here. It'd be the last pristine property in the whole county. You know, that was some of the logic behind behind buying it because I knew they'd never be foolish enough to drill near a nuclear blast site. Millions of people live below dams all over the world and they're perfectly safe and, and that's what this is. This is an earthen dam between us and the radiation and everything's fine until somebody goes to drill a hole in the dam. As far as the Department of Energy is concerned, there is no problem with drilling oil and gas wells. The first indication I had that there was going to be any kind of drilling activity within the three miles around here was when a surveyor showed up by snowmobile. Uh, I was working on a cabin here. It was almost finished. I was in the final phases of, uh, you know, uh, doing the interior. And uh, I pretty much, you know, I stopped then. I'm like, I'm not going to put my heart into it or my family's money, you know, anymore until this situation is resolved. And uh, it, it kind of broke my heart when I heard there'd be drilling hundreds of wells around here and none of us, none of the landowners, the surface owners, uh, none of the community that I know of had any idea that there would be any drilling activity. Let me, let me tell you the word nuclear uh, sounds alarms and just the word itself and I hope that by understanding a little bit about kind of what happened, what the testing was done and everything that these alarms by the end of the day become a little bit more less of alarm and become more maybe of like a sleeping pill even because uh, I can tell you the conclusion now is that there there is absolutely nothing to be alarmed about and nothing to be concerned about. My biggest concern is the track record they already have for uh, drilling up here. They've had one man killed who fell off a rig. They've already had a spill. The second well they put in this drainage uh, they uh, didn't set their casing low enough, so they blew out all their drilling mud and went right into Battlement Creek. Uh, contaminated it. Uh, do natural gas activities threaten to release dangerous materials? No. This is this has already been asked, visited, done, tested. The site's been depleted of its natural gas. They haven't even finished their studies on it. It's uh, not closed. I under, I understand that. I understand that. But because I'll get to that in a minute. All the data that has been used in the past to facilitate the drilling is probably 30 years old. Right now, the uh, Department of Energy has said they're going to step up their study uh, and punch it out next year. And, uh, you know, if they, before they said it was going to be 2011, and now they can suddenly produce one in six months. I can't imagine it's going to be very comprehensive. Particulate, solid matter radionuclides were not mobilized by the drilling of these wells. That doesn't mean they're not down there. Yeah. yeah uh, but we understood it. They cleared that radiation out and burned it. So that was brought up. There is radio. Yeah, let me. Okay, this is particulate in the rock samples itself. In other words, when you're bringing. It sounds like you're saying there was nothing. No, I'm going to get to that, actually. No, you're right. You're right. Now, what will effectively happen, I believe, in this area is that. Uh, Presco's drilling activity will accelerate the community comfort in this area. Um, and I do that, I say that because I think Presco has willingly taken over a lot of the testing, environmental monitoring that should be undertaken by the Department of Energy, but has not been. It's something that is part of this community's heritage. And uh, I, I think that uh, having a lot of wisdom about it within the community is important. Do I think that the word nuclear in this case sets off an alarm? No, I think it should set off a lot of comfort. It's just part of the history, and uh, in that sense, you know, we should we should uh, willingly address the knowledge. The legacy that they're leaving here, I'll probably live my life out with no problems, you know, health problems or anything. But um, there's generations from now that will have problems from this blast site and from the industry itself from what's going on 
around us, there's a there's a whole lot of uh, benzene, and other chemicals and stuff that are getting in the atmosphere. And you, you know what will probably happen is these companies are big right now that are drilling. They've got a lot of money behind them, but as these wells start drying up, they're going to sell out to little tiny individuals and operators. You can make a few hundred a month off of them, and uh, pretty soon they'll walk away, and we'll have 10,000, 15, I don't know, 20,000 gas wells and all the infrastructure and roads that are involved with it and contamination and pits, unlined pits, that someone's going to have to clean up and it'll probably be a, you know, a super fun. What is peak oil? Oil production globally has been increasing for 150 years, but we're nearing a moment in human history, a great turning point in human history, when oil production, after rising for uh, 150 years, will plateau and then slowly begin to go down. That moment where oil production hits its zenith or its apex is called peak oil. Why do we think we're near a peak? about 25 of the world's largest oil producers have already peaked. U.S. oil production peaked 30 years ago. Very few Americans understand that. Uh, after our production peaked, we simply imported more oil. We disguised our domestic peak uh, by importing oil from more, to, more than 30 nations. When the world peaks, then by definition, oil is going to become more expensive. A peak oil is something that was really put forth before the American public by Dr. M. King Hubbard. And he did this 50 years ago. He observed that 200 years ago there was zero production of oil, and 200 years from now there'll probably be zero. The peak oil in the U.S. was in 1970, and Hubbard in 1956 predicted it would be in a five-year window that included 1970. Now he predicted that world oil would peak around 1995. It hasn't peaked yet that we can tell. It's possible that it might have peaked in the last year or two, but it'll be a while before we know. So what does it mean when in the United States both domestic oil production has peaked 30 years ago natural gas production has peaked 30 years ago and global oil production is nearing a peak. What sort of energy policies should we pursue when that happens? It's a great question and it's a question we're just beginning to wrestle with as a nation. Energy is an IQ test that Americans tend to fail. We don't think about energy very intelligently in this country in large part because we've had so much of it. Historians will look back at the 1990s as the big bonfire a period in our history when energy was really inexpensive and our houses got much larger, our vehicles got much larger, and we just used as much energy as we wanted during those 10 years. What we're faced with now is not running out of energy, it's running out of cheap energy. And there's a national need, I believe, to begin using energy more efficiently and to begin actively conserving fuel. An energy policy of drilling and digging and burning and consuming as fast as you can, that's a profoundly liberal policy. Now save the energy, use it sparingly, be as efficient as possible, conserve energy, that's a conservative policy. And my question in Washington is where are all the conservatives when we need them? How long will it last and what are the patterns likely to be if somebody comes up, a minister in the government, and says, uh, you know, we've got the 100 years worth of oil shale or something, and it's oil shale consumption, say, is growing 5% per year right now. Well, what does that, uh, what can you tell about the future from that? And uh, the answer is that, that it won't last 100 years. That's obvious. How long will it last at, at no growth? And we're having growth, that means it'll last less time. President Bush has a wonderful opportunity. He could do a Nixon goes to China deal on energy. He could call the nation together and just do a little fireside chat. And he could explain some of these energy fundamentals. It would be quite easy for him to do. He's an oil man 
and he could explain, look, uh, oil is black magic, it's wonderful stuff, but our production of it peaked 30 years ago. We've got to become more efficient. We're sending too much money overseas and some of that money is being diverted to the same terrorists that we're also spending a lot of money to fight. It's a really simple message that any American can understand. At the same time, the president could call on Americans to become more efficient. He could launch a Manhattan Project or an Apollo Project for renewables, energy efficiency, and cleaner forms of fossil fuels. And all of that, I think, would meet a ready reception among the American people. So either President Bush will do this, or the next president will do it. I don't think we have much longer than that. I think either this president or the next one will be obliged by reality to give this long delayed speech to the American people. It's been one long day since I left my home on Divide Creek where I belong. Where the mule they run and sage is number one And nap wheat grows more than corn And Canada sells heating gas to the town I thought that they would be true They drilled my ranch, they sucked my gas They bulldozed my homestead too What have they done to the old home place? How did they blow it down? And how did they poison my water and hay by drilling for gas in the ground? In Canada, Left to drill somebody else The flaring burned up all my hay And now I stand where the old home stood Before in Canada blew it away Land values went south, the cold wind blows As I sit here and hang my head I've lost my ranch, I've lost my home And now I wish that I was dead what have they done to the old home place? How do they blow it down? And how do they poison my water and hay by drilling for gas in the ground? What have they done to the old home place? How do they blow it down? And how do they put benzene in Divide Creek by drilling for gas in the ground?